on urine, and the MIBG is quite uh, specific uh, for uh, paragangliomas, which can confirm the diagnosis and mitigate against biopsy. These are surgical lesions that need to be resected. Um, they can be very uh, heterogeneous, uh, not always T2 dark. Um, this is actually T2 gray, if you will, ISO intense. M most of the time they do have avid enhancement and they will restrict uh, diffusion. Uh, again, they arise in the wall of the bladder, in the detrusor muscle, um, so they are like in intramural type uh, lesions. Key, again, is restriction of diffusion, the MIBG. You want to might think about what else is T2 black, T2 dark in the urinary bladder, and that is, uh, you know, a lyomyoma, which can be very nice and smooth. It can mimic um, a um, paraganglioma. These are uh, tumors that behave just like lyomyomas in the uterus, so gradually enhance, delayed enhancement, and really typically no uh, washout in these patients. All right, case four. We have a 64-year-old female with chronic urinary tract infection. And these are her select images from her um, MRI. We have an in-phase T1. We have a post-GAD fat sad T1. And then we have axial and coronal T2 weighted images. Couple of findings that you want to think about in this uh, this area. Take a look at the morphology of the kidney. Take a look at what's going on in the kidney, and take a look at what surrounds the kidney. So, is this retroperitoneal lipomatosis? Is this renal replacement lipomatosis? Is this angiomyolipoma, or is this XGPN? Excellent. Renal replacement lipomatosis. In fact, I learned about this very um, um, late in my career, so I was, uh, it's very humbling that you learn every single day when you see a different case that you may not know. So the, the idea is that you have an end-stage kidney, um, usually due to a stone, you know, obliterating the UPJ that allows for the renal parenchymal atrophy and then the perirenal fatty proliferation. So it goes uh, into the sinus of the kidney as well as into the perirenal space. So what happens uh, technically on these patients, they have a staghorn calculus. The calculus then allows for uh, atrophy and chronic obstructive pyelonephritis from the stone formation. We know that. We've seen that with calcial uh, dilatation. And then the end stage one of the areas that can go is this renal replacement lipomatosis. The other is XGPN, which we will also see. But there, it's really replacement of the sinus and the perirenal space. So the key is it's the end result of severe atrophy of the renal parenchyma, renal sinus, and perirenal fat. And uh, you could see it's usually due to longstanding inflammation, uh, kind of a burnt out kidney, and they, this is the surgical uh, specimen of that uh, patient with extensive uh, perirenal fat formation. It can certainly coexist with XGPN. The two can overlap, um, particularly if you are dealing with a struvite or an infected uh, UPJ stone and you have inflammation going on, but the renal sinus and the perirenal fat. We know what XGPN looks like. It's very similar. It's blown out calyces, large staghorn calculus. Usually that is due to a uh, um, infected struvite stone and superimposed with the urease positive organisms. You know, the classic is proteus, but clinically we see a lot more E. coli with uh, xanthogranulomatous uh, pyelonephritis. Okay, case five. This is a 35 year old. Uh, female who presented for follow-up for an incidental finding. So just take a minute to look at this and the morphology of the kidney. This is a post-contrast images. This is a pre-contrast T1. We have the diffusion weighted images in the ADC. And then we select images from T2 weighted images.
So what do you think this is, is what's the most likely diagnosis? Is this a hemorrhagic cyst? Is this a sarcoma? Is this a neuroendocrine tumor? Or is this an abscess? And this is neuroendocrine tumor in the setting of a horseshoe kidney. So it's uh, not something you want to uh, forget. You won't see this commonly, but if you start seeing a tumor that arises in the uh, horseshoe uh, kidney that has the kinetics of a solid renal mass, you want to start thinking uh, neuroendocrine tumor. It's a little bit different than the neuroendocrine tumors that you see outside of the horseshoe kidney. So we typically would want to have T2 bright. We typically want to have avid enhancement with neuroendocrine tumor. In the horseshoe kidney, neuroendocrine tumors are not. They're actually T2 dark. They actually have very low grade enhancement um, to it. They almost simulate a papillary uh, renal cell carcinoma. They are rare. It is associated with horseshoe kidneys. Um, instantly down, found and these patients can often have uh, carcinoid syndrome uh, with that uh, component. Again, here's another patient who has a neuroendocrine tumor in the horseshoe kidney, T2 hypo-intense, hypo-enhancing, not intuitive in our brain. It def defies what a neuroendocrine tumor usually typically does. But again, it mimics a papillary or chromophobe type renal cell carcinoma with a T2 and low grade enhancement. Obviously, there are other tumors that arise in fusion anomalies, you know, renal oncocytoma. This is a renal cell carcinoma. It's fair game for any other tumor that can uh, develop, uh, but just so you know, carcinoids also can develop in horseshoe kidneys. All right, case six. We have a 41-year-old male on chronic steroids since birth. So images of his right testes and then coronal post-contrast images uh, of his CT. So what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Is this von Hippel-Lindau? Is this tuberous sclerosis? Is this congenital adrenal hyperplasia? Or is this MEN1 syndrome? Excellent, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And I'm not gonna go through all the details uh, of what happens, but what goes on is you will see the dichotomy of the adrenal rests from the, uh, the block of the ascension of the testicular. And many of these patients have uh, giant myelipomas. Uh, they present with salt wa wasting. Typically, it's 21 alpha hydroxylase, but we will see other um, uh, enzymatic deficiencies that allow uh, for this. Um, sometimes, if you do ultrasound, you will see this cribriform morphology of the adrenal gland. It looks like a brain. That's the whole purpose form uh, of it, but they can be giant bilateral myelipomas or testicular uh, rests in, uh, uh, associated with in, in the, adrenal, in the uh, testes. Here's another uh, patient with uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The rests of the testes typically are um, on the mediastinum peripherally. Uh, they can be unilateral, they can be bilateral. Um, it's something that when you start, when you see them, you'll, your eye will pick up on it. Um, I like to see uh, the CT to look at the adrenal glands. The women also have it on CT in their gonads and ovarian remnants. So something to keep in mind, this is not only in males, you, might, you will see this in females um, as well. I just wanna see if I have time for another one. 24 year old male, it's a little busy, but he had a testicular mixed germ cell tumor and you could see that he's 50% teratoma, 25% embryonal, 25% seminome. This is his original presentation uh, on staging. You could see his LDH is high, AFP is high beta. Now he's on, after eight months of treatment with BEP, 
bleomycin, etoposide, cisplatinum, that's the key treatment. You could see that the tumor markers are going down, but what the heck is going on in the abdomen? So here you are, you're gonna to talk to oncologist. You're gonna say, what is the next best step in management? Is this progression of metastasis continue saying chemotherapy? Is this progression of metastasis change chemotherapy? Is this transferred to a new tumor recommend surgery? Transfer to infection recommend drainage? Our GU colleagues should know this. This is transformed into a new tumor recommends surgery. Okay, let's talk about what this is. This is called growing teratoma syndrome. This is something you will see in patients who have mixed germ cell tumor where the original testicular tumor has a component of teratoma. So what happens is the teratoma, which is mature, it's not malignant, mature uh, teratomatous uh, uh, elements start to uh, become uh, very large and cystic in attenuation. It differentiates to mature teratomas. You will be the person who will tell the urologist, this is teratoma you need to resect. You don't want to continue doing chemotherapy on these patients. So cystic change, um, particularly you have to have the germ cell mixed component at the primary tumor. It does not respond to further chemotherapy. These are excised uh, surgically. Just a few other uh, cases, this is both in men and women, and uh, the resection uh, looks like metastatic disease and is indeed um, uh, growing teratoma. Here's just the last case, I just wanna show it to you for the uh, female uh, backup here, mixed germ cell tumor of the ovary, diffuse peritoneal mets. She's been nine months after both surgical debul debulking and adjuvant chemo, and it's a lot worse. Every radiologist was calling her progression, progression, progression. They kept changing the chemotherapy until, the, uh, uh, until we saw her and we uh, said these look like teratomas and indeed it was all benign, mixed, uh, mature teratoma. Okay, thank you so much and uh, thank you, Dr. I just want to thank you very much. Um, you, I just want to mention also that you are one of the most distinguished educators in the world. Uh, you are the female editor in